Now I want to move on to our next section, which is all about um, uh, culture and awareness. Um, so, you know, really, how do we engage our people um, in a, com a conversation about security? Um, so, Masha, um, first of all, I want to um, clear something up, and I know you have a brilliant response. Um, users, <laughs> we can call them users. We don't call them people. Um, why, you know, why are they called weakest link in security? Uh, what's your stance on that? Yeah, so I think calling our users, I'm going to go back to that, that word for now, <laughs> weakest link is, is an excuse for our inability to, to change their behavior. And we as security teams have the choice. We can say, all right, so I'm rolling out this really terrible training everyone skips through and, and no one's changing their behavior. No, I have a choice. I can either say my approach is wrong or the end, the end user is wrong. And, and quite honestly, I think the security world has a little bit of work to do on our level of arrogance and how, to, how we occasionally apply uh, ourselves to solutions. And so it's much easier to say, well, the employee is the weakest link. It can't possibly be my brute force one size fits all training that, that hasn't thought about what the end user is experiences at all. And so it's truly a weak ex excuse of uh, an, an, an acceptance of the status quo instead of um, truly being a rallying cry for for understanding how we unlock this potential of defense for our organizations. Yeah. Um, and as a, a second point to this, I um, it's really fascinating to me because I think about the human element as a layer of defense. It isn't the only layer of defense, but in as we think about a risk as a whole, it becomes just one of the many components that we use to defend our organizations. The processes we put in place is one of them. The technologies we put in place is another. And the human element, behavior, is the, is the third. And we don't expect our technology to work 100% of the time. We have concepts like false positives, false negatives, and like an acceptable risk. And yet we don't have the same concept for the human element. We say, oh, someone's going to click. There must be the weakest link. Why is there a double standard here? We should be looking at the human element as just another layer of defense with its pros and its cons, and it should absolutely be layered on top of what we are already doing. But no one solution, not technology nor humans, are going to be perfect or the silver <laughs> bullet that, that we, uh, we sometimes hope for um, in our defense. Yeah. And when it comes to the topic of training, you know, there are um, many people who might not find the concept of a training course on cybersecurity super appealing um, and very understandably they don't want to add to their to do list. So how do you motivate people who, you know, um, not, ne not necessarily their day job, but certainly are part of the solution? How do you motivate those? Such an interesting thing. So one of the things I've realized in my career is that almost never uh, will I be, ever, uh, be able to get an employee to care about security the way that I care about security or the way that my fellow peers uh, can care about security uh, uh, on the security team. But what people do uh, have is intrinsic motivation of things that they are already wired to care about. It could be things like competition, reward, getting promoted, um, having a sense of achievement, unlocking a really hard problem and feeling really good about that. There's amazing books in the behavioral psychology world, um, and an easy read on this topic is Drive by Daniel Pink uh, that talks about what motivates us as human beings. And what we can do is start tying security to the things that already motivate us. And so recognizing that when you reach out to, say, Joe in sales, Joe is so busy. He has so much to do on his plate, and, and you're just giving him more work to do, more training. And if you don't, first of all, tell him why it's important to the bigger picture of the company and to his job, he's, it's a compliance uh, ask, and it's going to be on the bottom of the list with a minimal amount of effort. And the second thing is, you're not giving him any reason to show up fully for that. Um, the why is helpful, and in the off chance that, the, that he cares about the company and, and security, great. But it's also great if you start adding a different layer around things that Joe might care about. People in sales, in my experience, really care about competition. So if you can show Joe what kind of uh, uh, track record he's had, what his streak of being fish-free, for example, it would be, 
is going to motivate him to continue to that mm -hmm. behavior. Same thing with leaderboards. Leaderboards are incredibly effective both for leaders in the company, executives and sales, where elements of accomplishment and recognition are really good for engineering and saying, um, you know, someone in this department has detected a very dedicated spear phishing attack, which saved our whole company from this type of attack and highlighting that in an all hands. So being able to tie things that we care about as human beings um, to security has proven to be incredibly effective in um, many of or the organizations where I've um, had a chance to apply this. Yeah, and it, it comes through in the training room as well, doesn't it? It's um, if I can, if you can call on some memorable examples that you have um, where you've seen a team really get into it and they have sort of adopted this hacker identity <laughs> um, that is really, really effective. Um, if you can recall some scenarios of, um, you know, the, the gamified experiences that you tend to do within your business. Yeah, so, so one of my favorite things to do is to introduce the basics of what an attacker knows or wants from you. What are, what are my financial goals? What are my um, political or espionage goals? Where am I going to get the data sets about you? And I like to turn that question around to the employees and say, now you put on the hat of an attacker. How would you attack yourself? What, what are the things that you know you would fall for? Um, and um, think through it, it's essentially in security, it's threat modeling, but how do we apply threat modeling to the average person so that they can understand their own selves as a system that can be vulnerable um, and can fall for it. And then start course correcting for that particular, um, particular vulnerability. Great. Um, and Wolf, your experience in, um, in leading teams and also from Duo as well, um, how do you develop a culture of reporting so that, you know, people can come forward when they might have clicked on something that, you know, with hindsight, they might not have done? How do you embrace that, that sort of culture of reporting? Yes, I loved Mesh's point about, you know, appealing to different user populations and what they care about, really tapping into the cultures of those different teams. Uh, there was a hospital that I was, uh, you know, very fortunate to work with, and they emphasized, much like we do at Duo, they emphasized the reporting metric, how, how long it took to get a report of a fish in to the security team. That was the result. Um, did you click or not? Okay, tell us that, but that's not the issue. It's a reporting issue so that we can go ahead and, and act in the back end. And uh, they did this again and again and tied it in with the culture and and had a whole bunch of fishing puns and rewards that people could have and had a leaderboard and really gamified it. But at the at the end of this, at the end of about six months, they brought in a pen tester, a very well known pen tester, a very famous pen tester. He's on television all the time. You, you, if I said the name, everyone would know it. So they bring in this pen tester and his team to fish. And he sends out this very well crafted fish. It's it's using the the hospital terms and it's using the right culture and the language and everything. And it goes out. And within nine minutes, a director at the hospital had identified it was a fish and reported it. Within five minutes after that, it was blocked. So you think about that entire timeline. Effectively, sixteen minutes of exposure for this fish before the security team blocked it and removed it out. And that's practically unheard of and that comes from tapping into a lot of things that mesh has been talking about about culture and awareness and really making it uh well known that hey we all slip up let's work together to address these issues